Welcome to another episode of the Voices for Voices TV show and podcast. I am your host, founder and executive director of Voices for Voices, Justin Allen Hayes. Today we have a familiar face, a familiar guest. You've seen him uh, be before. Uh, he was a recipient of our 2023 Founders Hayes Award at our A Brand New Day event in October of last year. He is the president and CEO of the Akron Cant Regional Food Bank, uh, Dan Flowers. Dan, thanks for coming oh, in. Oh, Justin, good. it's great to be back with you. And hello to everybody. Uh, I've uh, enjoyed very much, of course, our relationship, um, the many great people I've met through you at your events. And um, I'm glad to get a chance to reconnect today a little mm -hmm. bit, talk about um, you know things that have happened in our lives uh, and hopefully uh, be able to share some uh, some things that are wor words of comfort um, mm -hmm. and uh, perhaps hope uh, to people that uh, decide to take the time to sit with us a little bit today. I've always found our conversations to be engaging, um, uh, transparent, vulnerable, um, and uh, very wide in scope. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. Great. Uh, so we'll uh, for for this episode and for our listeners, our viewers, this is going to be part one of a two-part uh, series with, with Dan Flowers. This is going to be, uh, we'll get, I guess, with, get the conversation started about uh, recovering from grief. Uh, it, recently, uh, within the last few years, uh, both Dan and I have uh, you know, lost uh, our, our father, uh, myself, uh, in, in March uh, of 2024. And, and dance, uh, I believe, a couple of years. 2021. 2021. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for us to get together, like Dan said, and just have a conversation just as, as humans and talk about you know, grief, uh, how, how we process that as, as humans and, and how we try to do that as individuals. Uh, and, and so I, again, want to thank Dan for just being vulnerable again, like, like sure. myself, to talk about some topics that maybe tough to, to, to speak about. Yeah. You know, it's interesting to that introduction. Um, you know, you mentioned how we process grief of, as, as individuals. Um, you know, my mind immediately, I thought, and as professionals and as dads and as husbands, uh, in our many roles, um, one of the things about the time that my dad was very ill and when he passed, um, it, in 2021 was the pandemic, of course, that was a very busy time at the food bank. We had, mm. you know, 40 members of the Ohio National Guard in the food bank working every day. We we're in the process of constructing a new building in Canton. Um, and on July 1st of 2021, barely two months after my dad died, I stood in front of 400 people with my mom, recently widowed, and all of my family in the front row, mm. uh, to cut the ribbon on this building that we built in Canton. And it was one of the most surreal experiences of my life. I was buried in my grief. Uh, and I kept telling myself that I couldn't let the depth of my grief in losing my dad, who was just such a wonderful guy and a close friend for me, mm -hmm. um, keep me from being able to celebrate in that moment uh, as the community so much deserved, as I felt I deserved, as my family so uh, deserved. But... It, the, the, the effect that that had on that moment was undeniable. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I had a lot of thoughts about how, wow, this grief thing comes along, the loss of people that we love comes along, while we're in the midst of life, while we're in the midst of responding to a pandemic or raising our children, and we become saddled with this new layer of deep grief while we are expected to and want to still function in the world. Yeah. So, so the question became to me, and I want to hear your thoughts mm -hmm. on this too, is then um, how do you do that? Like, how do you go out into the world and function while you're um, broken, and walking wounded? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I think I've got some perspective on it now, a few mm -hmm. years out, but um, you, know, you just lost your dad in March. Yeah. I mean, you're in the peak zone. How you doing? Uh, okay, and to what you were speaking about of having an event, a loss of uh, someone very close, uh, you know, our, our fathers, 
uh, it was a little bit of, uh, I guess we knew that given his diagnosis that he had maybe a, a year, year to live. And when we were told that last year, we wanted to make him as comfortable as possible as he go, going through treatment, even he could be treated but not healed or, or, or cured. And so in the back of our mind, in the back of my mind, was, okay, at some point, it, he, my father's no longer going to be on, on earth. And what am I going to do is, if somebody that has always, uh, always been, been there uh, when I was going through my lowest mental health-wise, uh, he would drive up to Cuyahoga Falls just to sit with me in my apartment for the day because I was so consumed with uh, anxiety and, and events and things that I was, I didn't really know at the time that I was burying in, inside my mind. So when the day I, I actually came and, and he passed, the whole functioning, just as a, as a human being, just, okay, I haven't eaten breakfast or lunch because he passed away at eight o'clock in the morning. And, and so that whole just grieving process starts. And I think it's, it's different for each, each person. And I found myself obviously emotional and, and it, even with that thought, with the diagnosis that uh, he, he wasn't going to be able to be healed. Uh, it, it was uh, a very surreal moment, yeah, for sure. as, as you mentioned. And then, let me, let me ask. Yeah, was was the day he died like a super long day for you? It was. I, I I'll never forget because I found out about nine o'clock in the morning that my dad died, and all day long I was like, "What do you do on the day your dad dies? Right. How, how are you supposed to act? Like I I can't do anything." today. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't feel like I can talk um, happily about anything. Um, I don't know how to even begin to process this consuming grief. It was one of the most surreal days I ever remember. And, and it seemed like that one day was, without question, the longest day of my life. It just went on and on. Was, did you have that kind of a day? It did. It went, uh, and, and what made it yeah, so even longer is we, he, he had the hospice set up and it's so in the living room. Me and my sister, we basically were living at my parents' house for like the last two weeks when we were kind of given the, well, it could have, he could pass it at any time. So we moved the couch closer to uh, all the furniture, so it was all surrounding. It's close to uh, my, my dad and in, in, in the bed, just so we were, I mean, we were sleeping there and we were turning them, we were doing like things that, and, and obviously healthcare and there's, they could use a lot of help with hospice. I don't know how they do uh, what they do, but we were trying as uh, my sister, myself, and my mom, trying to, to turn them, to give them med medication. And uh, it, it was just so hard. And I was actually, I'd fallen asleep and then my sister woke me up and she said, dad's not breathing. And uh, my, I mean, I was like two feet away, and and so we uh, we we sat there uh, and started to grieve. Like, oh my gosh, like I I've, I've never been around like a dead body. I mean, just like yeah, and just, he like, just passed. Yeah. You were there at the moment. Yeah, that's a shocking and surreal experience uh, for so many of us. And you know, when when in those time leading up to that. I think it's probably true for a lot of people uh, that have, are watching this that mm -hmm. have had those moments, you know. I hope I didn't interrupt your flow just now. No, no, I'm glad you're... Something very sacred. No, you know, you're good, know. yeah. Well, um, I, I had a chance to, like, play the guitar and sing hymns with my dad oh. while he was grieving. And I remember at your event... Um, that gal that was like the therapist. Yeah, Isabella. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking about how she w sits with people when they're when they're dying, and they make up, they write kind of a words to their life, uh -huh. and then she puts it to music, and they sing their. It reminded me of the the, the Native American death song, uh -huh. you know, like this sort of like. 
being present with it and the, her role. I would imagine in your experience, you probably had some sweet moments with your dad oh, yeah. on the way out too, right? Yeah, I, I, I like reading to my daughter. I like being an instructor at Walsh University and sharing and whatever experiences that I have and, and the course content. And I found myself, I was reading to my dad. It's like he, uh, his name's Patrick, and so it was coming up on St. Patrick's Day, and he was at uh, Mass one day, and he was reading, and he, he said, your readers today will be uh, you know, St. Patrick. And, and, uh, and so it was just the whole St. Patrick's Day, just embraced it like over the course of his life. And, and, uh, and so on that, uh, Anyways, I, I guess yeah. the other point, so there's a, when you read the kids, there's, the, what they call like board books, like those real small books, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. thick pages, and there was one about St. Patrick's Day, and so I would read, I was reading it, like, as if I, like, it was like I was reading to my daughter. Yeah, yeah. And, and I could see, and the, the like I said, hearing's one of the last parts to, that, that goes from the body, and he would, I could see him like nod. Receiving it. Re yeah, and, and that was so surreal, as well as uh, he went, before he went from his, before he went into the kind of hospice care, mm -hmm. that just really different part of the bed, a bed in his room, my mom and dad's room versus the, the hospital bed that they came in. He was always reading uh, John 3.16, and so he had a bookmark there, and so even as a, body was kind of deteriorating from the d disease he'd put his glasses on i mean i don't know if I, I mean i think he was understanding and and he won and and so that was another part where i would just read the, those uh couple verses mm -hmm. to him and uh that he uh that he uh was reading kind of in his last last days uh I guess you don't have to be in your last days to, to read that, but that was something that but I was trying to... you saw that being of a comfort to him. It, yeah, and that was... And I, and I actually have a picture reading uh, the... Actually, the, the St. Patrick's Day book, uh, and he, like, uh, like tilted his head up, and, like, it, it seemed as though, like, he... Like, he was acknowledging, yeah. like, he was hearing it, and... It was like something like a familiar voice, and sure. um, and, and so those are some of like the the, the sweeter moments, kind of at, mm -hmm. as the, the days uh, were unfortunately coming coming to an to an end. But as far as uh, you know, get back to the the grief that that day was super super long, yeah. And then just being able to function just as a human, like you said, like okay, am I going to go to work? Am I going to do this, or who am I going to tell? Yeah. And it, it, I find myself, I'm leading meetings. I've got 50 people in front of me with a full agenda today about projects that have to be done. Um, and I can barely stand the fact that the, that night or maybe the next day, mm -hmm. I'm going to drive up to Michigan to sit with my dad because we're on this death watch, right? So mm -hmm. all of these things come together. Uh, I do think there's a lot more grace out in the world mm -hmm. when people know we're passing through this, that they extend to us. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that I learned, affirmed um, a Bible verse that I've always carried with me because it's, I think, one of the great verses in the Bible. It's from the book of Deuteronomy. It's simple. It simply mm -hmm. says, as your day is, so shall your strength be. Uh. As whatever happens today, mm -hmm. your strength is equal to that. So as a young guy, mm -hmm. I um, never would want to... Th I, I couldn't have had this conversation and, at 25. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't have participated in, as, as someone who's ever faced grief, nor could I affirm uh, to myself at that time that I had the strength to face it. Mm -hmm. I hadn't. But through all of the grief and challenges and losses in my life, I've found that I'm still here. Yeah. And I'm affirmed that as my days are, so shall my strength be. Um, so I can talk about my weaknesses and fears 
and losses and mistakes because I know at 54, something I didn't know at 24, is that indeed my strength is equal to my days. Right? Yeah. How about that? That's right? so beautiful. So, 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 so that's something deeply affirming in this. Um, and, and I think when I went into this, this grief experience with my dad, mm-hmm. I remember thinking, how can I lay in this bed with him and hold him right now? I, I've got three beautiful kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and I brought my kids up to, with, to, to be with dad while he was going. And, I, and two of them couldn't even go in the room. It was too much for them. Yeah. They weren't ready, but I had one who slipped right into his bed and held him, you know, uh, kissed him on the head. And so there's something about this getting in close that's scary. Yeah. Um, not everyone can do it. I didn't know that I could. So, so, so there's this grief thing and the, the, the strength, this affirmation of strength that by, uh, but also I've noticed that as my kids watched me go through that, and have watched me heal from that and honor him like I did on Saturday because it was his birthday, October 5th. Um, I think they are starting to get the seeds planted in their hearts that they are going to have the courage to face it when it's me who goes and deal with, grapple with mortality. So I think that there's these other lessons being taught. Him teaching me how to die Mm -hmm. with courage, the moment teaching me that I can face that and maybe a piece of it translating to them thinking that they can face it too. So I, I do think that per time has given me those perspectives on that experience. Um, but I would say, you know, when I was six months into it, no, not yet. Uh, too much in the storm. Mm-hmm. Too much loss in the shadow, in the, in the, in the grief. And if I, if, if I may, because yes. I'm rattling on. I got really? another thing for you, though. Please. Because right after my dad died, somebody's laid a piece of advice on me. And, of course, you get a lot of advice. Mm -hmm. uh, And I'm good for going around offering it like the world needs it. But uh, every now and then something cuts through. And so Shelly Hinton, uh, a wise soul who I was working with at the time, um, she told me right after dad died, she was like, I have heard it said that grief is like being placed in a box full of ping pong balls. And every time one of those balls hits you, it hurts the exact same. You're never leaving the box, but little by little, they'll take it out so there's only one left. So you won't get hit as often. And what I have seen is that that is exactly true. So six months went by, and Mm -hmm. I might have gone for a full day without really, really being shook by it. Eight months went by, I'd have two days in a row, or maybe three days in a week. Yes. And here I am three days later, and I can go you know, pretty much a, a week sometimes or, or longer. Not, not thinking of him, but not being slammed with grief. Yeah. Um, and that's how we heal. And, and so, like, there's no shortcutting it. The balls are coming out short. You're never leaving the box. You're always going to be vulnerable to taking that hit. Yeah. That hit's always going to hurt like it did on day one. It's just going to come left often, less often. Mm-hmm. And so that is my advice for anyone in grief. Yeah. You know, is that it will get better. You'll get hit less often. And it's not a dishonor to the memory of your loved one to not be mired in grief all the time. <laughs> oh, my. That's so powerful to hear that. that yeah. That was, that is one of the things I have been wrestling with. I told my therapist to, about uh, how how to uh, like I said, how to how to process things and not feeling guilty for the days or the just our conversation mm-hmm. like okay i'm not at this very moment thinking uh, about laying him to rest or I mean, we're we're speaking about the the events and so you know there's that guilt of should I, should I be always thinking? And a thousand percent, am I dishonoring him for those moments when I'm not, not thinking? Because I feel like when I come back to be in that space of thinking about him and having conversations with him spiritually, that I, I'm 
I almost like feel guilty. And like, yeah. I'm sorry, Dad. Like, I. Well, and you know the whole time in your rational mind that the thing he would want most for you is to go on with your life and be happy. But every time you catch yourself being happy, you somehow feel guilty that you're dishonoring him. Yes. I, that's, that was what I, a trap yeah. I fell into. So, you know, I cer certainly don't want to represent that I'm here today as someone who's healed from his grief. Oh, you're good. Um, or that I got through it smoothly because it was messy and it sucked and I probably drove my wife crazy with it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I, I guess I just want to represent a little bit that it does get better uh, while we talk about what the close-in experience is. You know, my yeah. wife lost uh, her brother to cancer in May, oh, uh, uh, you know, and he's almost the same age I am. Oh, and so I had an opportunity not long after I went through this with my dad to go through it as a spouse. And I have to say, you know, I, and I feel guilty about this. There was a lot of times this summer I was like, I wish she could just snap out of this. Yeah. So we could go down to the camper and have a good fire tonight and have fun and laugh together. And as much as, and I felt super guilty for that. Yeah. So as much as I uh, had just gone through this with my dad, while she patiently and lovingly sat with me in my grief and my not wanting to do anything and my mm -hmm. depression in the moment, mm -hmm. two years later, the, the cards get flipped and I'm challenged to do the same. Wow. And I'm embarrassed to admit it, right? Yeah. And it just makes me think these are complicated things. Um, and uh, while we're passing through our grief, it's impacting the people around us. They may be impatient with us or, uh, and feel guilty about that. You know, every time I would think, geez, why should she snap out of it? I would be like, oh, my God, because her brother just died, right? Yes. Of course. Most people, I would bet you, can relate to what we're talking about right now. Yeah, I believe so. It's out there for everybody. Forgive ourselves, forgive other people. Mm -hmm. It's all covered under the very basic things that we were taught as kids. But when we're in that fire, God, sometimes it just doesn't do anything to console us. Exactly. Well, uh, it's the la last part of this particular episode. Wow. Uh, well, yeah, I, I, I know. Just, like, <laughs> it, just getting started. It, just getting started. Uh, wow. The as, as my dad was going through the process as our family was and in our own way handling things different there were arguments we were having but it was all like we wanted the best care and it came to the point where my dad who wasn't curable with the type of cancer he had and he went through all the chemo all the shots all he went through so many procedures and just went with it and when you spoke earlier about being strong, I, I mean, I've never seen somebody so strong, not complaining, understanding in his own mind. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm not afraid to, to die, but here we are as family. Like, well, what, what's that going to be like? Is mom going to be okay? Like, is she going to be able to? I'm scared, right? You know, like, that, that's what I'm thinking in the moment. I'm seeing my dad's fear, lack of fear, but I'm feeling it. Like, I'm scared, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And then the, my, my daughter, uh, she, she's five. And so we tried to do the best we could as explaining. We, we brought her uh, around and uh, to see him as much as possible. She's... The last time she saw him was, I think, maybe a week uh, before uh, he, he passed. But I was, it, and as, as we are, we're, we're not just struggling with grief in the moment for ourselves, but I had a, fi you know, a five-year-old daughter. How am I going to explain, like, oh, well, we're not going to go see Pappy. And so when he did pass, like, I, I, I got down to her level and sat down on the floor and just said, uh, they said, you know, Pappy, you know, he's been sick. He, you know, he, he didn't do anything wrong, uh, but, you know, he, he went to heaven. And I was very scared about that moment. Uh, like, my daughter's never, never going to see my, my dad in, in person again. And it just killed, killed me to, like, okay, uh, how am I going to process that? And so that that drive from Canton to to Stowe that that afternoon evening is like I got to tell my daughter to 
you know, he, he's passed, and then as the services go on, say more, and these are memorials, and you go to the cemetery and say, this is a memorial, and, uh, you know, we can take flowers, and we, you know, we can uh, talk. And the one thing that's still, I mean, and it probably will, will never go away, uh, is she goes, well, which door did, which door did he go into? Oh, wow. And, like, we can just, like, we can just go and go and go in the door and, and see him, like, he went up to heaven, and... I mean, even like talking about it just now, uh, I feel good talking about it and getting it out. Yeah. Uh, but when she said that, it was just like, oh my gosh. And then so that whole, am I being a good parent? Am I oh, doing God, enough? Yeah. It, it, yeah. I, yeah. So, you know, uh, again, I'm just a food banker. I'm yeah. not a therapist. Oh, or no, yeah. I'm just We're a guy just, who's lived. Yeah. You know, uh, so I, I want to uh, qualify any advice I give, but I think yeah. these words are true. Yeah. Um, grief is a, is a messy thing, as is life as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to pass through it with all of these layers of guilt and regret um, and solemnity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not just the grief of loss of a parent. I think I experienced a similar grief when my kids went away to college. I mean, I grieved. Oh. I went in their room after oh. they were gone and sat there. And I, and I thought about over and over again, like, it's done. Yeah. That time slipped away from me. I remember when I was seven years old, crying on the Sunday night, right before school started after Christmas break, and my mom saying, what's wrong, Dan? And I'm like... Vacation just came and went. I couldn't stop time from passing, Mom. It hit me like a rock. I was just sobbing. And so something hit me early on in life, which is this awareness of the passage of time. And I'm smart enough, even as a kid, to know what that means. Right. I'm going to die someday. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I have always carried that. And my work all of my life has been to find joy after realizing that, Okay. you know? And so, so my kids go off to college and I'm like, this time passed and I couldn't stop it. And now these sweet years are over when dad dies. All of these times have happened, this closeness, and now this is over. But what my life has taught me since then is that there's something waiting for me now in this new reality that will redeem this loss yeah. and at seven or at 35 or 42 i couldn't know that okay. but 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 now i know uh that life has gone on since these things uh new relationships have formed i've been able to assume a new reality as a parent in relationship with my kids without my dad being here anymore i might I'm, I'm going long yeah. uh i'll just say it gets better, and I'll stop. No, sorry, I, Justin. No, I was just getting wound up. There's no, more don't, there. Don't, no, don't be sorry. I, it, our conversation, just talking, is uh, just as humans, is a little bit of healing, just in that. Oh, God, and so, yeah. Me whether, too. We're, whether we're a medical professional or not, like we're, you know, we had that lived experience of like we've gone through it. Uh, many of our viewers are oh, listening. This is real talk. This, yeah. Uh, and I just want to, again, I, I always try to do is thank you for being so transparent with your, your life and and what goes on the good, all the the cra craziness. So That's we're gonna, an honor. Yeah. So thanks again. Oh, of course. Yeah. Good luck to you, pal. We'll thank we'll you. come back around and stay checked in. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And thank you, our listeners, our viewers, uh, for watching, listening to this episode of the Voices for Voices TV show and podcast. Catch next week's. Uh, episode as well with uh, Mr. Dan Flowers. We were talking about food insecurity, uh, disaster relief, how that is impacting uh, things uh, with, with, uh, with his work at, at the food bank. And we just want to thank you for your support, uh, love at, at, at this time and at all times. So until next time, I am your host, founder and executive director of Voices or Voices, Justin Allen Hayes. Uh, thank you to Mr. Dan Flowers for being in studio with us today. And until next time, please be a voice for you or somebody in need.